Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us wherever you're watching from around the world and the wind has just blown away all my notes but my name is Alison Walker and I'm delighted to be your host for today's action, our webinar action that is, you know, covering the Olympic Games for me is the pinnacle for any sports journalist and I've been lucky enough to report on uh, seven of them now so I'm absolutely in my element here. Sadly, not in Tokyo right now, but looking forward to going there uh, working next year. And you know, it's always a great pleasure to be part of the Brodies team and be involved in events like the Brodies Tennis Invitational. I'm really looking forward to that next year. It's going to be a very, very busy year for sport. Tokyo should have been underway right now, but it became another in the long line of major events postponed until summer 2021 because of COVID-19. Um, in the meantime, what about the impact of the pandemic on sport? What does this mean for physical activity and well-being? What's the impact on athletes uh, preparing for Tokyo and how do they get back on track? So these are some of the areas um, we'll be looking at. Um, so yes, a very warm welcome to Olympic hopes and dreams back on the road to Tokyo and the impact of COVID-19. A little bit about um, this being the latest session in the Brodie's Enlightened Thinking webinar program. It's a range of insightful um, insights delivered through webinars, podcasts, uh, blogs and much, much more designed to keep our audiences up to date with the latest legal developments, current market views and more. And if you want to find out more about that, uh, program, catch it on brodies.com. Right, enough of me, um, and I've been itching, as you can see them there, to introduce our two fabulous guests to you. And here they are. We have Britain's most decorated female Olympian, former rower and chair of UK sport, Dame Catherine Granger, DBE, and Commonwealth badminton silver medalist and Rio Olympian, Kirsty Gilmore. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us and welcome. Thank you very much. Great to have you with us. Catherine, first of all, um, what was your first reaction when you heard that Tokyo was being postponed? Uh, probably like a lot of people mixed in that, um, in all honesty, the first reaction was relief only because everything, you know, it was March and it was everything was starting to lock down as far as the UK was concerned. Other countries are already, already going into lockdown. There was a sense that this virus is much bigger than anyone had predicted. This was going to have a bigger impact globally than we had thought. And things were going to be very different. And yet uh, the message from both the International Olympic Committee, the International Paralympic Committee was the games will go ahead as planned for quite a long time. So I think all athletes, well, I can't speak for them all. A lot of athletes I spoke to, a lot of people involved in sport were feeling the same of, hang on, you know, this is, this is getting uncomfortable because for people's health and welfare, Things are stopping in this country for good reason. And yet, you know, people are still having to train because the games are saying they're going to go ahead. And if I was still an athlete, I'd be still going, well, if it's going ahead, I'm going to be in the best shape. So I'm going to try. But actually, if I've got nowhere to train and suddenly everything's shutting down. So when the message went out publicly, it's over. It's not happening this year. I think there was a relief because it felt like that was the call that had to be made and it was the right call to be made. And then quite quickly, you move into the reality of, you know how disappointing that is and and then what now because there was still a gap between then the announcement that it will go ahead next year if everything goes to plan um so then you know and there was a sort of quite a short gap but a gap of they're not cancelled they're not postponed we don't know what they are yet and now they're now they are postponed we know it's a year's time and it's next year so absolutely felt like the right thing to do um you know i do feel for for everyone having to plans are so different than anyone expected for everyone in every walk of life right now it's a very different world but it also and I think I think the sports world has got perspective as well this is happening to almost every single person across the globe it's it's you know we're all having lives disrupted and actually a delay of a year isn't awful it's manageable well let's get a, a, an athlete's reaction and you talked about the athletes Catherine what, what was your first first thought Kirsty when you heard um, well, going back to when they said they were adamant that it was still going to go ahead, um, I kind of thought back to Rio and the preparation um, that we did for just going, or even for Commonwealth Games, the preparation um, hygiene-wise that we go through. Um, we literally have full 
you know, lecture theatres where all the athletes have to come together and you get taught all of the hygiene things because especially in Olympic Village, I think it's something like bringing like about 26,000 people into a, such a concentrated area. And the, yeah, the amount of hygiene that, um, precautions that normally go into games um, is crazy, it's incredible. So the thought of how that would even work with a global pandemic going on, I, when they said, no, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna rethink this, I thought it was the totally correct decision because I couldn't imagine um, being in an athlete's village right now. Um, it's such a, it's, it's a concentrated like world. You bring people from almost every country in the whole world together into such a concentrated environment. Um, so yeah, I, same for me, relief. I thought it was the absolute correct decision. And it's, it's strange um, to have an Olympics not two years in between. So normally it's so nice for us because we have an Olympics, two years, Commonwealth Games, two years, Olympics, two years, Commonwealth Games. And now it's going to be an Olympics and then a Commonwealth Games for us. Um, so it's it's strange, but the prospect of still having it and still having um, that kind of earmarked in the calendar as, as the big thing is is really nice as well. Yeah, the sporting calendar next year, Catherine, is going to be so squashed. The sheer logistical side of putting on not just the Olympics, but all the other events that have been postponed from this year as well. I know, and it, I, you know, the one thing that's been, there are some good things that have come out of all this, and one thing is how important collaboration is now more than anything, so you've got all these sporting bodies having to have the conversations of saying, you know, actually who fits in where and what can be done, and that, you know, we don't want things to overlap, we don't want athletes to have to choose between events, is it possible to shift things a few days, weeks, months, either way, so that people can still attend, and, and every event can still have its moment, and you know, it, it, it is, it's going to be you know, a very busy year next year because a lot of things, rather than being cancelled completely, have just been delayed. And But then you think the year, the sporting calendar is already very busy. You know, every year is a busy year for sport for, for different reasons. So when you suddenly try and compress almost two years into one, it's what 2021 will look like. It's going to be hectic. But, you know, it's, it's like life. It's about decision making. It's about prioritising and, and it will... You know, it already feels like, well, that's, we all planning for that now. So that, that's sort of become the normal of actually, now we all know things will happen next year and the focus has moved on to that. And what about you then, Kirsty, in terms of planning um, the qualifiers for, for Tokyo gaining the ranking points? Because that's what you were all geared towards this year. Are they cutting back on events? How's that working? So we still had um, a four months or no a couple of a couple of months of our qualification period left so um you know we haven't finished that yet so i'm part of the bwf athletes commission so we've been in really close contact with bwf figuring out how we freeze the rankings how we unfreeze rankings and how we finish off the qualification for tokyo um which is different and i don't understand a lot of it but they seem like they've got it under control um but we're still having um events cancelled uh, we just got noticed yesterday that the four uh, big asian tournaments in september are cancelled and i was kind of starting to think about making decisions on it was taipei korea Japan, uh, China and Japan. Um, I was starting to make decisions on, am I gonna, is my body going to be ready to go back into that? Because I've had 15 weeks of no badminton. Um, and yeah, there's hardly a week in the badminton, in the year calendar that there's not a badminton tournament that you can compete in. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'd put money on, there's a, there's a tournament that you could play every week if you wanted to. Um, so this is really, really strange for the badminton community to not be like constantly still going. But um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to be busy next year. So, so take us through lockdown, Kirsty, and what you've been doing to, to keep fit, to keep training. What, what have you been up to? Um, we were really well supported by the Scottish Institute of Sport and by Badminton Scotland. So every Monday morning we had a, a meeting with the full squad and the coaches. Um, and so they set us a twice a day program um, and I think a lot of people were complaining about being bored or kind of saying that they were a bit bored in lockdown. I was busy. <laughs> just I was pretty much just keeping up a full training program as best I could without a shuttlecock. So I was pretty much down in my in my car park of my building in the basement, just 
pretending to play badminton, like just doing all the movements. Um, and I've got like a really small gym in my building as well, which I'm really fortunate to have. So um, yeah, I think I, I managed to upkeep my fitness pretty well, but it was uh, definitely a mental struggle, especially at the start. But then I kind of learned to make the absolute most of every single one of my sessions and um, appreciate the fact that I had the space and the equipment to, you know, have that upkeep. So tell us about the toilet roll challenge. It's not what people think, folks. Um, tell us about what you did with the toilet roll. <laughs> um, it was a bit topical at the time, right, right at the start of lockdown. And um, my friend from Denmark, Mia Blickfeld, she'd started a kind of mug challenge that people had been sending her videos uh, after she started this. So it was just serving a shuttlecock like across the room into a mug. And I have never been able to do that. I have never gotten that shuttlecock in that mug. And then I just, um, I have a big, big box of shuttles. It's got about 500 shuttles in it. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna be, probably be here for the whole afternoon, but I'm gonna get a shuttle into a toilet roll because it's when they were all sold out and whatever. Um, and I think I did it on the sixth shot. And then I was like, well, okay. What did I do with the rest of my day now? <laughs> I surprised myself. It's just being creative. I mean, you guys, it's, I guess every athlete's different um, in, in what they do. Some, some will, will, it's the mental health aspect of this, Catherine, as well, isn't it? The whole, you, you can't do what you're meant to do. So, you know, and we're all affected by that. As you said earlier, all of our, our mental health has is, is been up there, you know, wondering what we're going to do. I know, and I think, you know, I think for everyone who felt it, um, you know, that, I think what was great was the initial phase of, you know, when it was real lockdown, there was still the ability to do some sort of form of exercise every day. And I think that was, that has really recognised that actually that, that sort of physical, whether it's just going for a walk or going for a run or going on a bike or something, how important that is to people's health. Because none of us are used to being indoors for this amount of time, and especially in one place or one room or one office or one building or whatever you've got. So I think it was important for everyone just getting outside. And I've met so many people who just walking are doing so much more than they've ever done before. Cause actually that's when almost that's you, that is physical, but also mental freedom of just changing, changing things around you. And I, and I think, you know, as Kirsty sort of said, it's a lot of people struggle at the beginning and then got used to it and adapted and found what they needed. And then some people kind of on, almost at the beginning were fine cause it was a bit of a novelty, but then as it went on a lot longer than anyone thought, then, then they began to struggle. And I think you've seen people come and there's the kind of roller coaster at different times, struggling in different ways. And, and the most, you know, the biggest thing is all of that is very normal. Everyone is going through something and it's okay. And it, you know, it's really is okay to one day be thinking, you know, lockdown's really working for me. I love it. And you know, I'm not, I'm not commuting. I'm not having to worry about going places and other days thinking, I hate it. I'm going, you know, I'm just going crazy about this. And, I, you know, I feel I can't do anything. So I think, you know, everyone has experienced it in different ways and, and kind of almost every way you're experiencing it is okay. Cause that's, it's not normal for any of us. So I think with, with athletes there, I mean, my experience with work, you know, being an athlete, working with athletes and now speaking to athletes, they are amazingly adaptable and, and resilient. They really do. They can shift focus quickly and sort of replan, but there's still a sense of, um, when you are limited, there's a frustration that builds because there's just stuff you're aware you wish you were doing. And I think interestingly from the competitive end, you know, when, when the whole world was in lockdown, it was sort of okay because, well, no one's able to do anything, but when you start seeing other countries moving around and doing more, then you get a little bit, oh, hang on, opposition might be doing more than I am. And then you start to see things start to shift. But I genuinely feel all the, all the work I've done in this country with sports, it's been incredibly impressive how, Every sport, you know, coaches, athletes, people have been very smart at how to adapt and also really putting people's health first. So, you know, not taking risks and, and giving the support where it's needed, you know, mentally as much as physically. And because ultimately, especially you're working with Olympic and Paralympic teams, if this all goes ahead next year, which we're all hoping it will, you know, we need people to be back in a great place. And actually, if, you know, if you're struggling now, a year away could still feel a very long time to go. And we don't know what will happen in the next few months. So it is trying to put in as much as you can. How, what do people need and how can you help people? Yeah, picking up on that from Catherine Kirsty, different countries at different stages handling the pandemic and watching your perhaps 
competitors getting that edge on you is, is that 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 must figure in your mind yeah I think I that's one of the biggest things that I do anyways I'm always comparing my training or myself to other people and other players which is a good thing it keeps me on my toes and it helps me like keep my standards high but also it's awful because yeah when I think one of our biggest in badminton one of our biggest competitor countries is Denmark and they smashed out the park within about three or four weeks um and here was us on week 10 just like oh going crazy so yeah that's um been that was really difficult um but yeah it's it, you kind of do settle into it and um I don't think uh, I've been in the Scottish Institute of Sports since I was I want to say 13 so that wasn't yesterday um but I think athletes mental health has never been um taken care of more than it is now and I've noticed that in the last I want to say three to five years we are given every opportunity we have a wellness diary that we fill in every morning for sleep fatigue um how many times in the last 24 hours have you felt uh, you know anxious um and i've never been so well taken care of in a mental health aspect than i uh, have been now well that, that that is really good to hear i did hear a quote from one of the um uk coaches catherine saying that we're all in this storm but we're in different boats, trying to illustrate how different athletes cope with, with different aspects of this pandemic. Um, and I guess that's the same, but you know, through society too, for all of us. I know, and I, I've, heard, you know, I've heard that said a lot of times. So I think it's a, a brilliant example because we, we're all in this storm somehow. We're all at sea in some way, but actually, you know, some people are cruising along in a lovely, like, you know, massive powerful ship, just, you know, owning the ocean and doing fine. And some people are feeling tossed around in little, dinghies and thrown by the winds and you probably you know it feels like everyone's in a different situation and sometimes boats be doing better than others not to overwork the analogy but it, you know there's a there's a something really good about the fact i think there is a the sort of community we're all it does feel like everyone's going through this together but obviously in different situations and you know some people and we're just saying and in, in, especially when lockdown was is most serious you know some people even you know the appreciation of having some garden space or some outdoor space suddenly becomes so precious and some people don't have that opportunity and that suddenly feels very different so you know i think people have had very different challenges but you know like kirsty was saying for an athlete's mentality it's it's you know how do you turn it to your advantage how do you find a positive in that how do you you know yes it's very useful to compare to other other countries or competitors but you still need to find you know a really positive i you know in some way i will better for going through this and Sort of flipping it to your advantage and when you can you know make that shift then it doesn't seem like it's you're battling every single day yeah and you get that reflected in business you get that reflected in all aspects of work what can we do to turn this situation to get something positive out of this situation yeah i think it, for me it's given me so much perspective because we don't we don't have an off season like i say our tournaments are january to january there is just no stopping um so for me to stop for a second and take a breath and be able to step back and see that Babington is not the whole of life um, has been I want to say revolutionary but I know that's a big word um, but yeah to take a second and not because I did the I literally sat down and did the maths for 2018 and for 2019 and um, I'm with tournaments and club matches um i was i'm away six months and home six months um so f this is the longest i've been home since i was 18 i think um since i started on the on the circuit um and this is pro during at proper lockdown was probably or was definitely the longest I've not played badminton since I was four years old. So it was a, a nice little rest, but obviously um, a difficult one. Yeah. Let, let's go um, uh, to talk a bit more about the Olympics. Catherine, obviously you've uh, been at, at quite a few as a happily retired, I would say happily retired athlete. Um, what are your reflections um, going back are they different from when you're in the middle of it all yeah and and partly and i don't know if kirsty's the same this partly while you are in the middle of it all you don't really reflect i mean that's what i think a lot of athletes have talked about this period of time being the first time they've 
during their career sort of stopped you know almost been stopped and therefore time to think but you only reflect on the the bad parts you only <laughs> go over them over again and again and again you don't stop to be like you know what i'm quite good yeah it's true you agonize rather than reflect over the bad stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, it's important to you in a different way but um no it's lovely and it is you know i think in a healthy way sometimes you don't really appreciate when you're in the middle of it you know, either like her saying, either how good you are or the environment you're in or, you know, because it's, oh, it's, there's so much momentum in sport. It's always moving forward. It's always the next thing. It's always about improvement. It's always, you know, okay, that was fine, but that's past now. Now what? And um, you probably get, you know, we always had breaks after the Olympics. So maybe every four years you'd get a chance. And, but you still probably didn't, I didn't really reflect. It's more you just took a break and didn't think at all. Um, and then it really is when you're retired, you can look back on the whole thing and, and I mean, it's hard because you don't want to make everything rose tinted because I'm not saying every day was an utter joy. And I, you know, leapt out of bed when, you know, the dawn alarm went off and I loved being out in the torrential rain and the, you know, freezing cold because uh, I didn't every day. But I do look back on that whole period of time as just an incredible time. You know, it was, yes, it was hard and it was tough and it had immense highs and it had heartbreaking lows. But, you know, it's such a, it's such a special thing to be part of. It really is. You know, and I do say it really is a privilege and being part of a, a, a you know, big national team and, you know, full of very motivated, driven, you know, passionate people who are all trying to, you know, achieve these incredible goals. And it's, yeah, it's, it's you know, you look back, you kind of hardly, you know, when I was growing up, I never thought that would be my life. I never thought that's what I would do. And you sort of by some random junctions in your life you think that's where I ended up but I can look back and go oh, I loved it I am so grateful I did it and you know, I did it for longer than I thought and I achieved more than I ever thought I would and I met more brilliant people than I ever imagined and um and it's such a long period of time you know every Olympics is different every Olympics is in a different sort of time and era somehow they're all obviously different countries different continents different things is happening globally different context and you know, I was sort of through a time where we saw probably the biggest changes we'll ever see in Olympic and Paralympic sport, where just, you know, incredible ranges of, of sort of success and a whole new ranges of sports growing up as well that you know we really hadn't celebrated before. So, yeah, really fond memories. Really good. And Kirsty, you've had experience in Rio, obviously. A lot of athletes pick up on being part of the multi-sport extravaganza because you don't really get to mix with athletes from other sports, do you? So they always, athletes always say, we love being part of that bigger team. Yeah, definitely. And for me, I am a, I'm a singles player in badminton. So it's literally just me on the court. Um, I don't get the, the pleasure to play with a, a doubles partner or anything. So um, yeah, to come together um, as part of a Team GB or a Team Scotland for a Commonwealth Games is just so lovely. Um, I've never had like a kind of, bad experience it's always so um just you see someone wearing the same kit as you and um Catherine will know they do like um okay so we've all got the same gb kit but there's a bunch of different colors so one day monday will be blue tuesday will be white wednesday will be blue thursday will be white so that you're all kind of uniformed in some way um and it's just a really nice experience to be part of with the physios and the doctors and you're all just you're all there for one reason and you're all there for one goal and there's just it's, it's just such a nice little environment i i really love it i love a multi-sport we've got some questions in guys one one from pippa and um, she's asking is there anything long term and permanent that you see will change for athletes or the olympic games as a result of this situation Catherine. Oof, good question um i think for the olympic games it's harder because i mean the international olympic committee will make all the decisions around the olympic games going forward and there's a big call about whether this will be the the shift and i think you know we're seeing it across every business right now is do you suddenly see different priorities and a different way of doing things and i think you know where some of the questioning has come around some of the challenge to the olympic games is you know, has it almost become too big and it's a very 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 expensive thing to host for every country and you know sometimes there's what's the legacy that's left you know we, we all in you know, there's always places that have 
have got the most incredible stadiums created and yet they're left to sort of ruin in the next few years and so there's a sense of um will this and it almost will depend on how the world shifts as well but will suddenly priorities be different will it be much more about you know it shouldn't be a one-off extravaganza it needs to make sure it's much more sustainable and and usable going forward and actually london 2012 is a good example of every venue sort of had to be proven that it would either be used again in its location or it had to be able to be taken down and removed and that was one of the big london commitments that it wouldn't be sort of empty ghost-like stadiums left for the future and that that was held too um, so I think in a way you'd like to think the Olympics, you know, none of us want to see, as, as you know, and Kirsty would say the same, they're, they're amazing events, but none of us want to see countries or cities crippled because of they've hosted it. You know, you don't want to see that impact. So, you know, if there's a way that they can not necessarily downscale it, but make it, I don't know, the infrastructure better supported so that you are not left with, you know, countries aren't left with debts. It's still a great thing to support. That would be, that'd be really positive to see. Um, as far as individuals and athletes, I think, you know, it was great to hear Kirsty talking about the support she's felt in recent years. And I think we'll just see that grow as we go forward about, you know, every, everything, I think every year, every challenge that sport makes you, you get, you know, you have to ask yourself the questions, are we responding in the right way? Are we looking after people in the right way? And actually you can learn and grow and develop that all the time. There's never, there's never a sense of, you know, we've done that now, you know, we've, we've, we've got, we've got mental health, right. Or we've got welfare, right. Or we've got, you know, the, the training in the gym is right. Like I was saying, as a, as a performer, you're constantly looking for improvements. And I think, you know, as someone now kind of in the other side of sport, it's still the same feeling of we're constantly looking for improvements. What more do athletes need? What more support is there that can be offered? And, and how do we keep athletes, you know, if and when things go wrong, like an Olympics and a Paralympics being delayed, then what else is needed to make sure that athletes are in a great place going forward? So I think we'll see... That's a very long answer, not really giving you an exact answer. I think we will see changes yeah. because of because of this experience. And I, I hope, as I'm sure we all do in every walk of life, that there'll be changes for the better. I think we've all learned from it and you know, prioritizing, simplifying, um, going forward. If we want to get the numbers down at the Olympics, I wonder about having it maybe three cities hosting it but I guess that would take away from us all being together Kirsty which is part of the draw of the Olympics that spirit of all the countries being together definitely yeah it's a huge part um even for like friends and family to be able to come and watch and stuff because it's such a it's such a spectacle and it does feed into the atmosphere of the Olympics um undoubtedly so yeah I think it would be it would be different. I don't know if it's the, the ideal solution. I don't know if there is an ideal solution, but it is a real shame when you see yeah, stadiums and venues used for two weeks and then there's no ongoing plan to, to keep them going. Um, I know, like, uh, I'm here in Glasgow and we could not have had the Commonwealth Games if there wasn't going to be a legacy for those buildings. Um, and we've benefited hugely from Hydro and for uh, Emirates Arena and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, to split it. We had the European Championships, which was... Uh, the athletics was in Germany. We had the golf and yep. the gymnastics and things. Maybe there's a, a structure that could be looked at from that. Maybe you know there's a lot of feedback from that. Um, I guess it's a it's an option, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's a perfect answer for that because the atmosphere of the crowds and the stadiums is such a huge part of an Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah. We've had some feedback from your comments about the hygiene requirements um, that you had for Rio. Um, Kirsty, what, what, what are the, some of the normal hygiene requirements for an Olympics? Um, what kind of things would you have been doing? Um, I'm sure they're different for every uh, country, but for us, we uh, took a course of probiotics um, before, for about six weeks before the Games, um, uh, just to up boost our immunity, our immune systems. And what else? We did, you get handed just a pack of hand sanitizers, and then there's hand sanitizer all over the village. Um, and also, oh, I thought of one more thing there, and now I can't remember it. Um, if you remember before Rio, we had the Zika virus um, threat, didn't we? And, and there was uh, some athletes didn't go because of that. There always seems to be something before an Olympics. Something seems to happen, whether it's uh, but, but nothing quite coarse um, on this scale. 
that's for sure. This is completely unprecedented. I remembered what it was. Um, all, um, your, every apartment is just kitted out with yakult. I don't know if this was a badminton specific one. Did, Catherine, did the rowers have yakult? Because we were... Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. I mean, it's a like probiotic thing, isn't it? So it's... Yeah, just keep kind of keep everything, any like small bugs from travel, try to kind of eliminate them because you could be in tip top peak physical condition and then a tiny germ that you've never come across debilitates you and suddenly your your performance is is gone um so just trying to cover absolutely all bases and um i think we're all pretty much upped our hygiene game in the last three or four months that's for sure and I, and I you know i think in a way i think it's been the most ready for covid19 coming because actually everything that we're all doing now in normal society is actually just what athletes do before the game so you know a lot of hand washing a lot of you know i mean just the gel stuff you're just used to you just had it everywhere you went it was added to before you ate after you ate seeing people being on transport and things because like kirsty was saying at the beginning you know you've suddenly got over 200 countries coming together uh, who have all been in, in you know different situations and different training circumstances and then you're suddenly putting them in a, a sort of massive melting pot together in the village and in the competition so actually the paranoia levels are very high about picking up anything that could affect your performance so hand washing and and, and you know alcohol wipes or gel were just part and parcel of, of competition and so actually you know we were ready to go come covid it just feels like the rest of the country is caught up now yeah and then diet's very much part of that as well here's a question from alex mckay has has Catherine and Kirsty struggled to stay out of the fridge as much as the rest of us in lockdown? Give us some tips. <laughs> um, I was very aware of my um, training volume dropping. We have to we have to log all of our training volumes uh, each day anyway. Um, so I knew that my training volume units um, were down so I was not burning as many calories each day so I tried to it actually give me like um, a chance to take a um, kind of new um, path on my diet and stuff so I would have breakfast later and try and do my morning session kind of empty um, and yeah I kind of found a, a good diet that worked for me but I do love a snack so no, I was still in that fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine? Oh, I know. It's awful. I mean, we're all human beings at the end of the day. We all have our weaknesses. But um, I think the hard thing was, you know, we all went from immediately working from home and suddenly wherever your home office is, it's not that far from the fridge suddenly. And it's not that far from the cupboards and it's not that far from the kettle. And, you know, sometimes I'd go, we're like, I've sat in front of a computer screen so long. I better, I better, you know, get up and do something. And the other thing was to wander off to the fridge and you just think why am i, I mean, you know, why am i I'm just here because i'm either you know bored or i don't know something's calling me from the fridge uh so i definitely went through i think i went through a phase of lockdown where it really was not good and then i sort of because it also there was that weird bit where you never felt you're on holiday but you sort of were so i've got really really good neighbors who are lovely and and they're retired and they would sort of drop me a message you know is everything okay you're doing okay check in do you want why don't we meet for a cup of coffee you know when you've got a break 10 30 11 or something I'll have a quick cup of coffee across the fence and then after about three weeks of lockdown it was like you know got to four o'clock would you like a gin and you <laughs> know it's really hard you're like well it's wednesday i'm almost halfway there you know it's maybe and you think oh hang on so you know i had to bring in a little bit of discipline back into my life because it was easy it was just a really unreal time where there were no rules anymore and then also everyone started baking bloody banana breads and suddenly everyone and their dogs offering you banana bread and you're like, yes, please, thank you. Are you, are you a baker, Kirsty? Did you join the baking? Did you of do the baking? Of course I did. Did yeah, you? Well I'm done. A sucker, I'm a sucker for a trend. That's good. <laughs> I don't bake, but we stay any longer, it might happen. My mum is a really, really good baker um, and so um, every Sunday we would, uh, she would, she would drop off a little whatever she'd bake that, that week and it was good. This, you're burning, you're burning off the calories by shadow badmintoning in the, in the garage, you're fine. You've got no guilt, don't worry. Oh, there's still a little bit of guilt there, but um, yeah, I'll just do a couple of extra shuttle runs, it's fine. <laughs> Maybe if we all, if we all get a badminton racket and a toilet roll, if you can still find a toilet roll these days, yeah. and uh, that, then we can have more banana bread. That's what I'm talking about. This is how we're going to get people into badminton. We're going to Good. Get
Well, we've got the target of trying to hit the shuttlecock into the muck because Kirsty wasn't able to do that, so. I know. And also she did it on six shots into the toilet roll, so I'm right, okay. Competitive brains kicking in. Could I do it in five? No <laughs> chance. No chance. I don't know if I could do it again in six, so yeah. Oh, you could. Tell us you could. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> we all know about the Olympics inspiring, inspiring youngsters to take up different sports, to, to perhaps, you know, go even further in that sport. Catherine, with, with your UK sport hat on, what, what do you think in terms of the impact of COVID on, on children's, on youngsters' ability to reach that potential? How's that going to impact, do you think? I mean, the honest answer, we don't know. Um, I think what's really sad is, and, and you know, I'm always a, a little bit of a sceptic when you read out any of the, the stats being published, because if you've done any work in anything statistical, everything could be sort of changed around. But there's some really sad, you know, headlines of of how, you know, despite some people doing more more physical exercise during lockdown, and a lot of especially children doing a lot less. Um, and you just think, you know, when local clubs are shut, when schools are, you know, obviously been in lockdown as well, and they don't always, not every child will have the opportunity to be doing things in the same way they might have done before. Um, I kind of hope, you know, the longer term ambitions are still there. You know, you hope all the benefits that Kirsty and I have certainly you know, experienced through doing sport, they still hold. And, you know, whenever we, I don't know when we'll get through this or when it'll, if we go back to normality in any way, but, you know, clubs are already reopening and, and, you know, places to come back together and do sport are still there. And you sort of hope um, what we've lost from this summer is the truly inspirational effect of watching the sport on the big, biggest stage of all when you know if you're if you're in any sort of olympic or paralympic sport the paralympic and olympic games is the moment that you get thrilled and excited by and you can't help you know i've met countless people over the years who would say i hate sport i never watch sport but gosh i'll sit down and watch the olympics and the paralympics because you know i love the stories behind it and i love you know the whole the visual bit and i think i'm already feeling like we just i spoke to some, one of my uh members of staff last week and we were just like we just think we're missing the games this summer we feel like we need something and it's a big lift to a lot of people so it's a real shame I mean I think you know this time next year we'll hopefully be there and it will all be different and hopefully this will all be behind us but I feel we're, we will miss a sort of inspirational hit and I think that's why there's a lot of the media channels have been reliving some of the past games because it's that and whether it's not just the games it's been Wimbledon it's been you know cricket it's been football it's been all the different sports have been showcasing historic moments because you're still trying to keep that passion alive in people and I hope young people can still look at that and think god you know I want to do that and I think the great thing is some of the, some athletes have been doing a brilliant job on social media of you know posting videos or exercise classes or there's still a sort of connection to some people who are going to be doing things but I think it is hard when you know we don't just lose the opportunity for the athletes this summer but we do lose the opportunity for inspiration and that that's tough but I would hope we don't lose, you know, a whole generation of young people because we've got a delay in a year. I really hope there's sport stronger than that to survive a sort of delay by a year. I can see you nodding voraciously there, Kirsty. <laughs> yeah, I think like sport's not going anywhere uh, in the long term. And I think there's been so many uh, things like Catherine says, like Joe Wicks has been, you know, keeping kids going in the mornings with like PE classes and things and not just getting people into sp specific sports, but people have realized just to get a bit more active for like going for a walk, even some of the, the badminton players, because our, you know, training's reduced suddenly we have a little bit more energy and we've kind of um, <laughs> realized that we can, like a nice release is, is going for a walk, which normally you, when you're not training, you just want to be as kind of horizontal. Um, but uh, yeah, I think do a lot of sleeping as well, don't they? Yes, naps. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, there's been so many other inspirational things um, and even like, you know, flashbacks and throwbacks to previous Olympic games. I think they've been great. Um, so the fact that we've not had an Olympic Games this year, I don't think it's gonna, um, there's been plenty more things to inspire um, kids and yeah, sport's not going anywhere, it's just it's postponed for a, for a second. Yeah, well, what I love about the Olympics is that it, it exposes those sports that don't normally get a lot of airtime. I mean, Catherine, if we think about rowing, how many millions got up in the early hours of the morning and watched you rowing for those medals? You know? I know. Well, I mean, I think, you know, 
in in the rowing world, we're we're all still in the the sort of shadow of the great Steve Redgrave and what he achieved. And I and you know I have still so many people who you know when he competed in Sydney in two thousand, you know his fifth games to go for his fifth gold medal, and that was a, an amazing sort of journey and that story that a lot of people followed. Very human story behind his achievements and. You know, that you're talking about getting up in the crazy times in the morning. So obviously that's the whole different time zone has been flipped when you go to the other side of the world. And, you know, so many people have got up to watch that moment. And it, and it, and and I think, I'm sure Kirsty would be saying the same. The thing you don't expect as an athlete is that you'll have that reach and that impact. You don't realise. And I think 2012 was probably the most that it brought home to me was how much those sporting events mean to people and how much people take from them and how people do follow that journey and do want to see the completion of a story and you know almost irrespective of the result there's this incredible human connection of of individuals going out to try and achieve almost impossible things and you know i think that 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 reach that sport has is really quite special and i think you know when you have the big games whether it's commonwealth games olympic games that's when you we see it more than ever so you know, I think as an athlete, you're, you're not even conscious of the millions getting up to watch at that time of day. And it's almost and a bit like we're saying, you don't, you don't really, you couldn't grasp it at the time. And it's actually as time goes on, when you meet people and you, you know, complete strangers in the street or at events and things, and people will talk to you about their, their recollections of where they were at certain times or watching certain people doing certain things. And, and that, I love that. That happens all the time, and it is it, it's always thrilling as an athlete. What what a lovely, lovely thing to be part of in a world that so many people relate to in some way. And and even if they've never done that sport themselves or otherwise, and like you were saying, the the amazing thing is, and I think especially in Britain in the recent ten fifteen years, how broad that range of sports is. You know, people never used to be able to watch whether it's you know archery or synchronized diving or you know, people become ex i mean i do the same i do the same i used to do the same at winter olympics um you know things that i've never done never tried never sort of experienced and you become an armchair expert after listening to the commentators and suddenly that that triple falco was you know wasn't landed quite perfectly and you know there's all these things you pick up and you can't help but feel involved and i think you know i think what we do so well in this country is not just this amazing array of sports because suddenly it means for young people or old people or anyone you know if you're not good at, at our national sport then you there's so many other options you could have a go at and try and that's brilliant but i also think our i do think our media when it comes to the games are very good at telling the stories behind those performances as well and i think you know as a spectator you you can't help but feel involved you know a bit about the person or the backstory because although we put these amazing athletes onto you know the physical podiums but also kind of we put them on high as heroes of us all they're so human and they're you know when you understand what they've been through to try and achieve it or what they've come up against and the highs and lows then you can't help but feel that you care about what happens and i think that that's when i think the sport really takes on a different level of, of experience for folk but going back i think what's lovely is increasingly over years we've seen far more women's sport we've seen far more um you know the paralympic side the disability sport and we've seen far more minority sports have their platform when it comes to games time and and that's really been special for a lot of people yeah i think the the thing when you're sorry when you're training it's so insular and it's so like, like almost blinkers on and then suddenly when you're either in front of a crowd or that you are made slightly aware that um there's people watching on tv or whatever the fact that someone else is invested in your career someone that you've never met is now emotionally invested in your career for this moment which could be the biggest moment of your life or career is madness and it's such a amazing feeling um and there's pressure that comes with that but that's you wouldn't have that pressure if you weren't great at what you do so it's, it kind of comes full circle full circle um and yet yeah, to, to have other people invested in your individual performance is is the nicest feeling but it's often something that you forget when you're you know almost being sick beside a court when you're knackered um, you're like ah oh, yes people will see this for you know an hour um and that you know they're going to remember it because it's going to have an emotional impact on them 
it's the connection with the stories. Definitely, as a journalist, that's what we love, and we love we love telling those Olympic journeys and, and those stories. So hopefully next year that will all come come to fruition. And um, we've got another question from Pippa. Um, what plans are there to boost inspiration to young people in advance of Tokyo? 2021. Um, get your questions coming in, folks. We've got uh, another 10 minutes or so to get your questions in. So that question, what plans are there to boost inspiration to young people in advance of Tokyo 2021? Catherine, I'll throw that to you. Yeah, well, I think, I think, and again, this is, a lot of lessons have been learned almost quite recently. So, especially since, say, 2012 onwards. So I think that the the scale of success, and I don't mean that in results or performances or medals, but the scale of success as in the connection to the public in 2012 kind of overwhelmed everyone. Uh, although we always thought it would be a good games, no one thought it would be uh, almost transformative games. And that is Olympics and almost more the Paralympics. The movements have changed over that, those couple of weeks. So I think some sports were almost caught out by the level of inspiration that was created. So, you know, suddenly all the clubs were flooded with young people, but I mean, people of all ages, but particularly young people wanted to sign up and become part of it. And I think a lot of clubs were caught out. And I know, you know, rowing itself had never had so many people wanting to come down to the local club and join up and learn to row. And but so much so there was waiting lists that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And ultimately you'll lose people because people will wait, but the inspiration will start to fade. So I think the lessons learned were sports have been much more proactive since then about predicting the moments when it could catch fire again. Um, and I think so sort of what people are doing for the inspiration. I mean, it's up every sport kind of takes their own responsibility to protect their own sport and to try and engage with young people. But a lot of it is using those huge moments. So the Olympics, Paralympics, the Commonwealth Games, where you can predict the reaction of a public and you can try and capture that moment. So, you know, schools do it, clubs do it. They do the build up actually more and more in a much more sort of proactive way of, you know, schools can do a great thing with, say, the values of the Olympics and Paralympics and engage different school years and, you know, host many Olympics themselves. A lot of things can be there, but clubs and sports themselves are taking a lot of responsibility of how do we use this as the biggest platform to, to get more people coming in and trying it the, the themselves. So kind of, I mean, there's so many ways now, especially through the power of social media and things of sort of saying these things are open for us, anyone to come and have a go, come and try. And they set up far more volunteers, far more open days, far more events that people can come along and, and get involved. So, but yeah, if Pippa's got any ideas about any more to add. I mean, we, you do, you just want to, those are such magical moments when they come and they come and go and then life moves on and you kind of think right while we have it and more importantly not while we have it but almost when we're waiting for it to come because it's the build-up that creates that excitement and anticipation and you want then to capture people um and and hopefully keep them in sport for a long time after that and i think i think young people have had a you know will have had a hard time through this this summer and it's been a very very different experience for a lot of people especially school age and even university age it's a very different experience and we don't know what will happen in the next 12 months so actually i hope sport is even more a role to play than ever before in in creating those you know it's a real community it's a real social side to it as well and really engaging people again so yeah that's another long way of saying I don't know exactly, but I think there's a lot of things will be done to create that inspiration again. And any ideas, please give them to us because we want to have that as big as possible next year. Your thoughts, Kirsty? Inspiring youngsters ahead of 2021. And um, yeah, I think for for badminton specifically, uh, especially in Scotland, um, I know we're trying our best to get. Um, the biggest amount of kids involved as possible and I think that's only possible with um, a sport like badminton because it's indoor it requires a set space and it requires equipment the accessibility to all that has to be easy there has to be a club within you know 10 miles of you um, if people are actually gonna engage with it over a continuous period and whether that's for just pure you know pleasure and enjoyment and just a bit of exercise or whether that's if they really engage with it and we can try to you know 
filter into satellite squads and you know higher performance squads and into the national teams um, we're really trying our best to make badminton available and I think that's so important with sport I think even for me growing up if it's like my style of play is really physical but I think whatever sport or whatever activity had been available to me when I was younger, I would have engaged with it. Um, but my, I was a badminton family, so that's you know that's the, that's, that's the avenue. Yeah, no, I had a choice. <laughs> but that's <laughs> the avenue I went down. Um, if it wasn't badminton, I think it would be football because it was available and I was encouraged to do it. Um, so I think yeah, the access to sport has to be has to be easy. Um, and I thought yeah, I think that's really important. In, in inspiring kids because it's so difficult. Thank God for my parents for driving me around um, sports halls for badminton, for football, dabbled in karate, you know, yeah, tried everything, but uh, because it was available. Yeah, I tell you all the parents watching this right now that ferry their kids to the various sports will we'll all, we'll all relate to that. Um, Catherine, is there a role for um, other organizations like, like businesses, like charities, in harnessing, harnessing sport and, and, and helping these youngsters get involved? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Cause it, you know, you sort of feel everyone who can play a role in this space will, will have an impact. Um, and I do, I mean, you know, this is, these things are so lovely to do. Uh, and it's lovely to spend time with, with Kirsty again. And I think some of our, you know, some of the best, the best things we have in sport is actually you know our athletes and our athletes speaking about you know their journeys and their stories and their successes and their disappointments and you know it sport is a i've certainly found is one of the most incredible teachers you know it really challenges you every day and it asks a lot of you every day and you know it, it's tough and it and you will you will learn and you will develop and and hopefully you will thrive within it but you know athletes who can talk about that and i think what we see post olympics an incredible time where athletes generally have more space and more time and often then go out and sort of flood all the, the school schools and communities and you know the sports halls and it's and it is constantly inspiring and exciting and I've you know walked into endless sort of schools halls myself and when you bring a, an Olympian in or a Commonwealth athlete in and tell their story and you know kids absolutely adore it whatever they do whatever they're interested in it's the story of you know it's a magical story and you you know especially all those people that are speaking to you who made it onto the olympic or the commonwealth game tracksuit at some point sat in a classroom like this and worried about what they would do with their futures and worried about if they'd be good enough and you know weren't sure what they were what decision life would take them and it, it makes it very relatable and and you know where can business or charities help out well you know, it's sometimes you can support either individual athletes or support programs and, and get athletes involved. I mean, athletes are brilliant to come and, and talk about their experiences and actually, you know, build a bridge. I'm not talking about sponsorship all the time, but, you know, there's things like in your local communities and things. And I do some work still up in Aberdeen and they do this incredible Aberdeen youth games um, in great facilities up there. And they bring almost every school in Aberdeen comes together and um, has this amazing, like massive school sports day. And, you know, that that takes support from businesses and takes investment from people. Um, and it's to give great opportunities for for kids to come along and play together and compete together. And also while they're there, there's a point if you if you want to build in a bit of education about the principles and values behind sport, because ultimately, you know, the highest ideals of the Olympic and the Paralympic movement are kind of human ideals. And they're very powerful messages of, you know, how to live your life and how to treat others and how to behave and how to compete and how to win and lose. And there's so many really positive messages. I mean, I think for people of any ages, but especially if you're focused on children, how can you bring in those really higher ideals um, and, and engage it directly with children? And, you know, I've seen some brilliant schools that have taken on almost the, the Olympic ideals and given out, you know, projects for each one of them and, and ask kids to come up themselves with what that means to them and talk about it and share and, and awards and stuff. And it's really, I think, when you get into it, if you really care about and passionate about it, there's endless ways to go with this. So, yeah, businesses and charities and anyone could get involved in this space. And and I do, I feel really strong. I don't think we've got, for example, school sport right. I don't think we've got that right yet. And I think there's so much more that could be done for young people, either in school or outside school. And, and that can, people in influential positions and people in businesses can make a big difference there.
Yeah. It's, an op it's good to see it as an opportunity perhaps for businesses um, and perhaps, you know, when we're tackling this, there's a whole obesity thing as well and, the, the, and there's, a, there's a question come in. Um, do you think that the exercise boom in lockdown will last beyond the pandemic and have a longer term impact on the UK's obesity crisis? Well, it's a, it's a big topic. <laughs> yeah, Kirsten, I think I'll put you to that one first. Yeah, I think there will be a kind of uh, easing off on the on the boom, as it were. But I think it's um, I think it's something that people have really engaged with, and not for a, you know like performance sport wise, but for a, just a it's a it's a nice thing to do. It makes you feel good. Um, and on the back of what Catherine was saying, just the things that sport teaches you. Okay, I know we can't get together in like real teams. Um, for kind of team sports yet, but just the kind of communication, teamwork, um, confidence building, that kind of thing that sport gives you, it can't really be replicated in, in, in you know, in a classroom or from the sofa. Um, and I've also just seen uh, Pippa's other comment of, um, I can't do any sport. That's also like such a beautiful part of sport and it's, it's not just about the people that are participating in it, like sport doesn't work without organizers and supporters and there's definitely there's a role for everyone in sport um whether it is um like i play i play for a club in denmark and in denmark they've got such a good system of your badminton club is something that your whole family is involved in and it's it's just ingrained within the community that it's almost you know if, if it was if uh, if it was a religious community that would be like your, your church but it's something that everyone gets together goes and does and feels good at the end of it and it's such a thing where like the parents take the kids and the parents play in the adult matches the kids play in the in the kids matches everyone brings food and so I think if we can keep engaged with that aspect of sport and um, the kind of community that it builds I think it'll have more um, longevity of, of the boom we're running out of time a little bit now, just a couple of minutes yet uh, left. We've got one more question here. Um, has Prince William's high profile work with mental health and footballers made it easier for athletes to acknowledge their mental health issues? You're an yeah, athlete, Kirsty? Yeah, I, I think it has. And I think, um, you know, I think there's, there's quite a few high profile individuals, you know, sports people and, and people from other you know, Ed Sheeran was talking about it at the news the other night, as well as Prince William and David Beckham. And, you know, there's, there's a countless famous people who have spoken out. And I think, I think it matches the reflection of society as well, that suddenly it's become acceptable to admit to having sort of a vulnerability or um, to admit that there, there are struggles. And I think when you see people who we perceive as incredibly successful, uh it, you know who's got everything in the world admitting they have struggled at some point and you know prince william talking about how difficult it was when he was you know young and losing his mother and and you know the issues facing that i think that's really good that everyone from every walk of life can say it doesn't matter you know how rich you are how famous you are how successful you are how popular you are actually it's difficult and we struggle and therefore you know actually when you're sitting at home and you don't have any of those attributes that that seem to make your life better then actually if they're struggling then actually it's very normal for everyone at some point to be struggling so i think yeah absolutely it's made it better for people to speak out about mental health and i think the more it becomes you know we talk about physical health all the time without even questioning it we don't think of, oh is it taboo or not we just talk about your physical health as athletes all the time and it should be the same with mental health it should become very normal to say i need help with this i'm not being good at this i'm better at this i feel good or i feel bad and you know like Kirsty was saying, I think it's sort of now far more of a constant thing for athletes, a check-in. It's not just a, how's your heart rate, how's your weight, how's your everything else? It's, you know, how are you feeling? How are you coping? Um, because there's things that can be done about it if, if you need support with that. So, yeah, I do think, I think the high profile figure speaking out has been helpful. And a yeah. quick word from you, Kirsty, to, to finalise. Yeah, I think it takes, I think it takes having ultimately roughly the same conversation over and over and over again, but phrasing it in different ways so that it kind of hits different people in different ways. Um, and I think having 
lots of high profile people talking about it is is great and I think especially um I think men and women face maybe different challenges in sport um and I also think no one's taught us no one's taught the generation right now we're all doing this for the first time it's social media and just all of that stuff is totally new and there's just no there's no precedent for it before um so we're all just trying to figure it out at the same time and it's it's a bombardment of of information and feedback that you know athletes 10 15 years ago maybe wouldn't have had to deal with so it's, a, it's another um uh, element to to being a professional athlete um and it's it's a difficult one um there's often some some dms that get sent when you've not maybe performed very well um which is a new challenge to deal with but um yeah i think a lot of there's i've it's been so noticeable the change in the conversations that are being had in the last three to five years definitely and it's a good change yeah. Well, that's really good to hear. I could talk to you guys for hours, but I'm afraid we will have to leave it there. Um, huge thanks to you both for joining us. Dame Catherine Granger, DBE, and Olympic badminton player and Commonwealth silver medalist Kirsty Gilmore. Thank you guys very much indeed for joining us. And thanks to you all uh, for watching and for your uh, questions as well. Hope you've um, enjoyed it. I, I certainly have. Uh, really looking forward to Tokyo now. I just wish it was, I just wish it was a bit closer, but um, I guess Kirsty, you need time to prepare so, uh, and get there. So, <laughs> so looking forward to celebrating the Olympic games as we should in Tokyo uh, next year. I can't wait. Thank you again, everybody, and bye, bye. for now. Bye.